The Eastern Desert is so named because of its location east of the Nile. Leaving Cairo, we wandered through this captivating desert. As we headed south, visiting the Baramea area rock inscriptions, the mangroves of Hamata, the town of Shalatin, and finally the remote Elba Mountains, just north of the Sudanese frontier. The interior of the Eastern Desert has many ragged mountains, sliced by large wadis. These wadis, together with small oases, are the focus around which life flourishes in this hyper-arid landscape. The Ma'aza Bedouins live in the northern half of the Eastern Desert. However, these pastoral nomads also occupy other arid landscapes in northern Africa and southwestern Asia. The gazelle is noted for its grace and gentleness. The eastern desert is the only remaining part of Egypt where one can still see many gazelles. However, hunting remains a serious threat. Hag Salim Abdel Adar guided us to the rock drawings in the region between Wadi Hamamet and Wadi Baramea. At first sight, the prevalence of boats in the art of the eastern desert seems very curious. However, in prehistory, the climate has been wetter and the landscape greener. The sheer number of these drawings indicates that the area supported a significant population, both human and animal. Giraffe, elephant, ostrich, ibex and gazelle were once abundant in the Wedis of Upper Egypt. Mangrove swamps, like this one at Hamata, are a haven for a number of marine crustaceans, fish and several bird species. Sharif spotted a horned viper's trail and followed it to this bush. This highly venomous snake buries itself in the sand awaiting its prey. When within range, it strikes with the speed of lightning. We left this amazing creature to perform its role in the ecosystem and paused to photograph this harmless tree. However, Sharif and Omar, who are both zoologists, spotted several venomous snakes within its thick branches. This Saharan sand snake is less venomous than the horned viper. As Omar was examining it, it suddenly struck him, injecting him with venom. During the course of his work, Omar has been bitten several times before by this species. He left the snake to return to the tree. And as he was photographing it, something sprang from beneath his feet. It was a horned viper. I just heard something go shh underneath my foot. He wasn't even in the sand, he was just sitting down. It was amazing to find all this under such a seemingly innocent tree. The diet of the sand grass is mostly seeds. Their colour provides them with camouflage in the sand. Whilst the sand partridge's coloration blends in well with its rocky environment. We came across a herd of camels heading to the camel market in Shalatin after a long journey from Sudan. Many camels collapsed during these difficult journeys 
and leave a trail of carcasses for the vultures who clean the ground from their remains. Lapid-faced vultures get the first turn. Their powerful bills rip the hard skin and tear meat from the bones. They build their nests at the tops of thorny trees. With a wingspan of up to three meters, the British call them the flying table. The griffin vulture has a distinct ruff of quill and down feathers at the base of the neck. The Egyptian vulture, also known as the pharaoh's chicken, pecks at the scattered remains or picks at the scraps off the bones. The juvenile is darker in colour, but the same size as his elders. The camel market in Shalatim is always bustling with traders from Sudan and Egypt. A colourful mix of tribesmen come to Shalatim. Like the Ababda, an Arab tribe living in the region from Qusair down to Benice, and the Bashari, whose territory is from Port Sudan up to Benice. Also, the Rashida, an Arab tribe presently occupying the area centered around Kasala in Sudan, though occasionally wandering around the eastern desert. The town is largely built of wooden shacks and has many shops selling all sorts of spices, herbs and merchandise, alongside artefacts including horns, skins and other products of wild animals. In April 2000, Mr. Mohammed Gard, the ranger of Elba Protectorate, confiscated a Barbary sheep which was captured and being sold at this market. He then successfully released the live animal into its natural habitat. Ironically, only a year earlier, we'd had a brief glimpse of a male and female in Elba. Prior to our sighting, it was thought to be extinct in the eastern desert. It was late afternoon when we arrived at Elba. At daybreak, we awaken to the serene beauty of Wadi Adaib. Sheikh Hassan, the head of the Bashari tribe in Elba, welcomed us and performed a local dance. The Basharis are an ancient group of hermatic descent. They live by herding, gathering and fishing. Nowadays, they also purchase goods like flour from coastal settlements. Their summer dwellings are made from tree branches, whilst their winter dwellings are covered with fabrics and animal skins. Their native tongue is a form of Tubidawi, an ancient, unwritten language. Wandering through this awe-inspiring wilderness, we spotted an Egyptian gecko. It's a common species inhabiting rocky wadis. We trekked up Wadi Kansas Rope. In the distance, we could see the sea below us and the mist covered peaks above us, which we were to climb the following morning. In the morning, we assembled with our Bashari guides as we got ready to climb the mountain. A layak is a twisting shrub that spreads over many trees. Our Bashari guides put them to good use. <laughs> they were witty cheerful and always geared up to sing and dance. 
we left the wadi and ascended the foothills of these granite mountains. Gavana, a local coffee drink, bread baked on the spot, along with a taste of Bashari folklore was served as we posed for a quick lunch. The Elba Mountains represent the northern limit of many Afro-tropical flora and fauna. This is largely due to the amount of precipitation Gabal Elba receives in the form of winter rains, regular morning dews, and the mist zone at the upper portion of the mountain. At an altitude of about a thousand meters, the hike became increasingly steep and difficult. We continued the climb until we came to a water spring. Beyond it were sheer granite walls which blocked our path to the summit. We decided to spend the night and look for another course in the morning. <laughs> We awoke with the first light. Hassan, one of our Bashari guides, broke this solitude with his cries. He'd never heard of Bill Clinton, but was all too familiar with Claude Van Damme. In Egypt, ombak trees are unique to the high altitudes of Elba. We ascended a different wadi and finally reached the summit. bird glided among the peaks. It felt like we were on top of the world. On our last night, the Bashari were awestruck as they gathered around my laptop to view the photos of our hike up the mountain. <laughs> joined in the flurry. A strong environmental ethic exists amongst the Bashari. Tribal law poses severe punishments for misuse of fresh water resources, excess herbage and the cutting of green wood. I sincerely hope that the increasing and advancing pressure of civilization will benefit rather than destroy our friends' fascinating lifestyle their breathtaking landscape.